A few years ago, I was in an extremely painful meeting that was a debrief slash postmortem on a very, very painful product launch. Uh, there were probably 15 of us in the room, around a crowded around a table. It was hot, it was painful, it was awful. We had a Trello board going with issues. We had every tool. We had a Trello board going with issues. We had a flip chart where people were talking about process problems that had gone on with the product launch. And we even had one of those bean bags where we were sharing so that we didn't talk over each other. Like you, only, you could only talk if you had the bean bag. And despite all of these tools, it was a complete disaster. And I had this flash of brilliance that we needed a timeout. And so I persuaded the entire group to go take 15 minutes and people scattered. Like they went to their desk or they went and had a cig or they went and got coffee. And when we came back, it, the energy was so much better and the meeting went so much better as a result. I have a bachelor's in electrical engineering from Cornell University and I have an MBA from the MIT Sloan School of Management. <laughs> but the reason that I knew we needed a timeout is that I'm a mom. That's how I knew. <laughs> I, um, I went, uh, you know, people, people are impressed with my background sometimes, and I tell them they should be impressed by the time that I was up all night in a pediatric ER with a concussed kid and still made it to the office. I was standing, right? People tell me I'm very calm in meetings, um, and you know, there was this time I had to get a screaming toddler on an airplane, and that, is, that requires enormous calm. And then people also, you know, I work at a startup, and I've often worked at startups in my career, and people say, wow, you know, startups have so much chaos, how do you manage it? I have four children. Wow. Two of them are twins. <laughs> I know from chaos. Okay? Not so bad. And if you look at my resume or my LinkedIn profile, you will see lots of good stuff, right? But you will not see nearly 18 years of skills and experience that really matter. And I call that my mommy MBA. And tonight I'm going to share a couple of tools in the toolkit of my mommy MBA with each of you. So my first story, my first tool, I call the power of mommy voice. Um, many years ago, I was an I on an IPO roadshow, which, if you haven't been on one, is very stressful. It's a series of days of meetings that are packed one-to-one, -one, uh, barely time to get from one place to another, with very stressful people, bankers, possible investors, journalists, blah, blah, blah. And our schedule was very packed. Um, and we had discussed the schedule, and we had emailed the schedule, and we had printed the schedule. And so we all went to New York with the schedule, which said 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, first meeting, actually in the lobby of the hotel. So the next morning, I get up, and I'm down there at 8.45, ready to go. No CEO. 8.55, no CEO. <gasps> so I started blowing up his phone, and when I finally got him right around 9 o'clock, when we were supposed to be starting, he was like, wow, you should have called me at 8 to tell me to get up. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, great. Can you come down? So we started about 20 minutes late, which threw off the whole day. The whole day. Like, you know, there wasn't time to, to, to blink that day. And we were started 20 minutes late, and it was a complete disaster. And at the end of the day, I realized that someone had to be mommy because someone was acting like a child. <laughs> so I used mommy voice. Now. I'm going to tell you a little bit about mommy voice in case you don't know about it. There are a couple of really key pieces to mommy voice, three of them. The first is that you use the person's full name. <laughs> Evan, <laughs> Catherine, Bronfman, you are, right? That's, this, you all know this because your mom used it on you, right? This is why you have a middle name. <laughs> so you'll know when your mom is mad at you, right? So the first thing, complete name. The second thing is you have to make really good eye contact with the individual. And if it's a child, that means usually getting really down, right in, right? And the third thing that I do, at least, is I use um, key phrases. This is not OK. This was not OK. I need fill in the blank. And then I expect you to fill in the blank. Key pieces of mommy voice. So back to my CEO. I say. James Allen Webster, come on over here. 
<laughs> he came right over there. I said, sit down, because he's 6'5", and if I was going to make eye contact, we had to be seated. <laughs> we sit down. And I said, today was not OK. It was a mess. I need us to be on time tomorrow. I expect that you will be in the lobby at 8.45, ready to go. Dressed, fed, caffeinated, nicotined, <laughs> and on, on a roll. And he said, OK. <laughs> and the next day was great. You know, and I took a huge risk using mommy voice. But I had to. I had to own it. And that's the thing about mommy voice is when you own it, it works. It's a miracle. That is a tool for your toolkit. My second tool I call um, is kind of about accepting and recognizing responsibilities. Um, and this starts with the story of Dr. Shannon Lucid. Um, I don't know if you've heard of her. She's a retired NASA astronaut and a biochemist. Um, she was in the first class of astro women astronauts that was recruited by NASA. Um, she spent 188 days on Mir in 1996, which was the longest time any American had spent in space for quite some years. She set the record. Um, she spent it with two other Russian cosmonauts, so she wasn't even on an American space station. And when she returned to Earth, she was able to walk from the shuttle to the transport vehicle, which had never been done before. Typically, <laughs> cosmonauts have to be carried. She invented exercising in space. She's really badass. <laughs> I'm a really big fan of Dr. Lucid. Um, she's also a mom, and she, has, she had three adult children at the time of her trip to Mir. So um, when she came back, she was interviewed extensively. And I'm going to read something from an interview um, that she gave when that she was talking about you know, reentry into life after being on the space station for so long. And she was talking about her family. And she, she said, we go out to eat a lot for the first couple of days. But then I started cooking. And I have my kids come over to supper every night. And they'll call up and say, are you cooking tonight? And if I say yes, then they come over. So. Did you all see what happened there? Dr. Lucid was in space for six months, and when she came home, her kid asked her, what's for dinner? Oh my gosh, right? Who, like, this is, like, you asked your mother, this, I get asked this all the time. I'm going to get asked it tonight when I get home. <laughs> right? <laughs> this, is, this is a really like, overwhelming question. And over the years, I've realized that it's not a question about dinner. It's a question about responsibilities. And my, what my kid is saying to me is, you are on the hook for this. You are always going to be on the hook for this. And I, you need to accept that you are on the hook for this. <laughs> What's for dinner? So there's a huge corollary in the working world. We all have a what's for dinner responsibility. It's that thing that your boss asks you about, or your board or your investor, no matter what you have gotten accomplished, no matter what you've done, no matter how amazing it is, this is your what's for dinner question. Like you are always on the hook for it. No matter whether you've been launching a product or you've been sick or had pneumonia or you've been in space for six months, this is your <laughs> job. And I would just suggest that as a tool in your mommy MBA toolkit, that knowing at any given minute what your what's for dinner responsibility is would be incredibly valuable. So number three. Uh, important sk skill, important tool, um, managing a toddler tantrum at the office. And I suspect everybody here can relate. Who here has seen an adult have a tantrum at the office? Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> okay. Um, it happens a lot. So in this situation, I was part of a, a pretty big team that did a product launch a couple years ago for an ad tech company. And there, were, there was a, it was a pretty cross-functional team. There was product and sales enablement and marketing and design. And we had done a whole bunch of work. It had required technology and it required some branding. And we redesigned it and we had named it. And we packaged it all up in a beautiful audiovisual multimedia presentation and gave it to our head of sales, who was flying across the country to present it to a possible client. And so we were back at the office, kind of all waiting to hear because we knew when the meeting was, right? And we wanted to hear how it went. And unfortunately, when it came, it, didn't go, it did not go well. Um, the, the sales exec sent an email around with just blistering language. You know, the, the product was kitschy. The colors were bad. It, it made me look bad in front of the client. The, the messaging was stupid. The positioning didn't work. It was bad. 
And then after he sent around an email to everybody on the team, which included very junior people, as well as people on the exec team, he started calling all of us. Like we were in this big open space and the phone was ringing and if you missed it, then he called the next person and he started yelling at people about how mad he was. He was having a tantrum, right? Big old tantrum right there on the phone halfway across the country. So um, let me tell you about managing tantrums. I have four children. I know this. I, uh, couple of things. The first and most important thing in a tantrum is that you have to make sure everyone is safe. Now with a kid, this is actually like physically important, right? Because the kid is flailing around and there's hard surfaces and maybe sharp surfaces. You have to actually physically make sure that the child is safe. Um, and you too, as an adult, if your kid's having a toddler, you know, I'm safe too, right? Everybody has to be safe, that's the first thing. The second thing, and pretty important, is to show some respect for the tantrum. You know what? The behavior is not okay, but something prompted it and you, you have to respect it. It's the core of respect for a child. So respect the tantrum. And then the third thing, and absolutely the most important, is you have to realize it has nothing to do with you. This tantrum has nothing to do with it. I did not cause it. I did not do it. I cannot fix it. All I can do is help, right? It has nothing to do with me. You let the energy go flowing right past you to wherever it goes. So, I'm back at the office. My head of sales is having a tantrum. So first, make sure everyone is safe, right? So I told the junior folks, delete the email, don't answer your phone, I've got this. <laughs> and they all went, <gasps> <sighs> like it was just like a visible big old sigh, they were all happy. And then I um, called the sales exec and I got him just as he was getting to the airport. Um, and I listened to him rant for a little bit of time, and then I respected the tantrum. I said, meeting didn't go well, you need changes. And then he went, <sighs> and I persuaded him to get on the plane to come home, because then he would be safe too. So that was good. And then the key three p third part, right, it had nothing to do with me. His language was totally unacceptable. It was, it, it was insulting and belittling and just bad. It had nothing to do with me. In amongst all that crap, he had three or four really solid suggestions that came out of a meeting that we'd sent him to in order to get these suggestions. And we did them, probably by the time he landed. It was done, right? So, the next time you have a toddler tantrum at the, at the office, remember, right, right? Everybody's safe, respect the tantrum, it has nothing to do with you. So, congratulations, you now have my mommy MBA. Remember that mommy pa superpower, that is mommy voice, Remember to always keep track of what's for dinner and you can manage a, t a toddler tantrum anytime you'd like. And I'd like to leave with one, like just a little bit of advice. Um, this story comes from when my oldest was just a baby and not sleeping. We were talking about this earlier. Um, and I got to the office one morning about 7.30 and I ran into a colleague of mine who usually came in later in the day, young guy, just out of school. And uh, Derek said, Casey, hey. It's great to see you. I'm so excited I'm here so early. I'm never here this early. How did I, I, it's great. How are you? And, and I started crying, you know, like openly crying. Because at that point, it's 7.30 in the morning. I had been up long enough that I had already taken a nap. <laughs> right? And I, it was overwhelming, right? So, so if you're, I don't know, if you're Derek in this story, and maybe you're not a mother or a parent, but you probably work with some, I would just suggest that you kind of keep track that, or honor that there's probably a lot going on that you don't necessarily see. And, and from a place of not pity, but of respect, right? There's probably a lot going on. And if you're me in this story, and somebody saying, isn't it a great day makes you want to start to cry? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it gets better, right? <laughs> Pace yourself, it's a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> and uh, when, when you get home tonight, and maybe this is for everybody, when you get home tonight and you're thinking about what everybody has said in this great space, call your mother. <laughs> Thank you very much. So wait a second, come back. Yes. Casey, allow yourself to be acknowledged. <laughs> Thank you.